the product of a political dynasty, son of the country's second prime minister, nephew of its third, a leader whose party has been in power since independence from Britain in 1957. I don't give up easily. I, I have a lot of determination. I believe in what I'm doing. Najib Razak is a political survivor, having weathered accusations that hundreds of millions of dollars found their way into his bank account via a state fund called 1MDB. There's no wrongdoing. The Saudi government has come out uh, with a statement admitting that it is an official donation. Now he's facing another test. An election against his former mentor, Mahathir Mohamad, who's now 92, was prime minister for 22 years. When I step down, and they call me a dictator, which dictator ever stepped down? And secondly, when I step down, people do curse me. I can walk around the streets and people come up to me and shake my hand. In this exclusive interview, Najib Razak talks openly about his achievements, his regrets, his opponent and the fallout from 1MDB. There's no doubting his political pedigree. A member of parliament at 23, Malaysia's youngest ever deputy minister at 25, 40 years in the business. Yet, to many, Najib Razak remains an enigma. His nine years in power marked as much by controversy as limited economic success. Bloomberg has secured the first international interview with Malaysia's prime minister in more than three years ahead of an election that's shaping up to be his greatest political challenge. Moving around, I feel that uh, um, most people, uh, you know, they want more predictability, more certainty, and they want a government uh, that's able to deliver. And the fact that over the last five years, we have delivered. And they know that we can deliver the next five years. I think that's key to the sense of uh, confidence. There is no um, uh, movement for, for, for changing the government. I don't, I don't see that. Uh, that's not saying that you know, we, will, we will win with a huge majority. No, I'm not going to predict that. But I'm going to say that we are uh, reasonably sanguine about the result. Uh, but I keep telling myself, myself and my, my colleagues as well, You've got to work hard. Are you willing to put a figure on how many seats you think you can win this time? Do you think it will be more than 2013? And is the two-thirds majority possibly <coughs> achievable? You know, I hate to set target uh, you know, for, for, for several reasons. Uh, but I think, I think uh, generally speaking, um, I, am, I am expecting a better result than, than 2013. Uh, uh, one of the reasons is that the, the opposition is uh, a motley collection of parties, uh, you know, and they don't have much in common and they, will be, they were very derisive uh, in their comments of one another for decades. Uh, I, I don't see how they can work together, really work together. Amno did lose the popular vote in 2013. Uh, looking back, why do you think that happened? And what are you doing this time to ensure there's no repeat? Um, in the call for a change, uh, which uh, basically uh, the urban and primarily the Malaysian Chinese believe uh, a change was possible. And I now today they know it's not possible. So I think that euphoria uh, has uh, receded to a great extent. So there's several factors, I think. And the confidence level in that kind of, uh, of coalition between uh, uh, you know, enemies over decades uh, is something that uh, it's hard sell, actually. And of course, uh, you know, a 93-year-old man trying to lead this coalition, it's, it's a hard sell as well. Mahathir was actually the man who helped bring you to power in 2009 and now here you are heading against each other in the election. What happened? What went so wrong with what was obviously a, a friendship and a, and a, a, a peer and a, a patron relationship? I think I have studied uh, the man. Uh, I think he is obsessed about control, about calling the shots. Uh, in fact, uh, when we were quite close uh, together, he even suggested 
uh, establishing a council of elders. And of course, you can imagine who's going to chair the council of elders. And, and you know, as a sitting prime minister, after every cabinet, I suppose I would have to march to his office to get his consent. I mean, that's not the way, you know, you run the government. I mean, for example, I mean, it's, there is this uh, gentleman rule, so to speak. I mean, you don't get uh, David Cameron uh, or, uh, or, you know, um, previous prime ministers in UK, you know, telling Theresa May what to do. And, and similarly, ex-presidents don't tell current presidents what to do. There is that you belong to a special club, if you like. Uh, and, and, and there is that kind of uh, mutual respect, understanding. And I, I, I'm, I adhere to that. One day, when I'm no longer in office, I would, I would not want to, uh, you know, to impose on my successor. Uh, but he is obsessed about control, and, and, and the key was that uh, he wanted me to do his bidding. Uh, for example, uh, he wanted so much a crooked bridge to be, to be carried out. And he was upset with uh, Tun Abdullah Badawi when he was Prime Minister because uh, he cancelled uh, the Crooked Bridge. And because Tun Abdullah Badawi uh, brought in uh, quite a number of, of young technocrats, uh, and that was a signal that uh, he was not going to listen to Dr. Mahade. So in my case, it was when uh, I, I did not uh, continue with his um, request or his obsession to have a crooked bridge to be uh, implemented. Uh, and uh, when his son, uh, Mukris, lost the vice president, Amno vice presidency, I, you know, I didn't say no to him, but I said I thought it was too early for him to become vice president. Not being a Supreme Council member, he'd have to prove himself his worth first before becoming vice president of Amno. But that was a turning point, and after that, uh, that was, he declared an open war against me. Do you see yourself as a survivor? At the last few years, there have been some, some difficult times for you um, in different ways. Uh, do you think that your opponents have underestimated you? Is that how you would describe yourself? Uh, oh, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you have to ask them. Uh, I, you know, I have, uh, I've always been uh, someone that's... Uh, you know, close to, um, to the people and also to the party members. Uh, you know, I believe in uh, uh, developing a personal relationship within the party. So even during difficult times, uh, the party stood uh, by me. Uh, they couldn't shake me. Uh, the support base is strong. Uh, and, and UMNO is even more united today than ever before. Uh, and uh, that's why, uh, you know, we, we have that um, sense of uh, uh, that we're moving forward uh, politically, economically and socially. One of the cornerstones of Najib Razak's time in power is the economy, which is enjoying its strongest pace in three years. GDP growth last year was almost 6% among the strongest in Asia. But that followed a string of difficulties on his watch as all prices fell and sentiment was hit by the scandal surrounding 1MDB. The Malaysian economy is making very uh, steady progress since we launched our transformation plan uh, in 2010. Uh, we've made uh, tremendous strides uh, in many areas. For example, if you take into account the growth rate from 2010 to 2017, we achieved 5.4% average and that's double the uh, growth rate for the world, global growth rate. Uh, if you talk in terms of uh, job creation, we created 2.7 million jobs. In terms of GNI increase, um, we have uh, achieved more than 50% increase in GNI. In terms of uh, capital market, for example, last, last year the capital market uh, grew by 12.6%. Uh, to reach 3.2 trillion ringgit. So those numbers, those figures, are indeed uh, indicative of uh, the success of our transformation plan. Going forward, what, what are your targets uh, to get to the balanced budget?